Thank you. The next item of business is topical questions. And we start with question number one from Jamie Green. Thank you, signing off, sir. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to improve out-of-hours GP services in the NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde area, in light of reports that only one in five centres were open on Sunday. Minister Clare Hockey. I expect all integration authorities to take every measure possible to ensure a safe and sustainable out-of-hours services is provided. However, arrangements are in place for Sir Lewis Ritchie and senior Scottish Government officials to meet with the management team in Glasgow regarding their ongoing review of out-of-hours and difficulties being experienced by the service. Since 2016-17, the Government has provided an additional £6.6 .6 million to the Glasgow Integration Authorities to support the implementation of Sir Lewis Ritchie's review of out-of-hours services. Jamie Green. Uh, can I thank the Minister for that response? But the reality is that this weekend in Glasgow, across the whole of the city of Glasgow, only one centre was open. And can I pay tribute to the staff at Vale of Leven uh, who had to deal uh, with the uh, uh, huge amount of uh, people coming in to see them. But what happens is when they phone NHS Direct and are directed either to an out of our service, in the south side or east end of Glasgow, it's virtually impossible out of hours to get to that location it requires a taxi or a lengthy car journey or indeed as most people do they'll turn up at A&E putting uh, more pressure on our emergency uh, centres on a very busy Saturday night so what I didn't hear in the first answer is what action the minister or indeed the Scottish government is taking to address this issue of GPs who whilst they're not contracted to do these out of our shifts are choosing not to? What are the reasons behind the GPs choosing not to do this? Why is this becoming a systemic problem in Glasgow? We know last year over 211 shifts in that uh, uh, Greater Glasgow and Clyde region uh, were not filled because of staff shortages. So in the second answer, perhaps the Minister can go into more detail as to what action she's taking to address this problem. Minister. I thank Mr Green for his question there. My understanding is that arrangements were put in place between Glasgow and NHS 24 over the weekend to deal with the closure um, and that ho a home visiting services by uh, GPs was available to those with that particular clinical need. I am not happy with the level of service and I expect Greater Glasgow and Clyde and the Health and Social Care Partnerships to take every step possible to prevent this happening again. As I said in my first answer, uh, Sir Lewis Ritchie and the Out of Hours Policy Team have a planned meeting with Glasgow on Monday the 10th of June to discuss the progress with Glasgow's review of their Out of Hours services and this, week's, uh, this weekend's issues will form part of that discussion. And we expect to receive an update following that visit in due course. And can I also take, uh, take uh, this opportunity to pay tribute to the staff at the Vale of Leven who uh, were uh, uh, obviously um, under pressure at the weekend and con considering they were the centre that was open. Jamie Green. Uh, thank, thank the Minister for that for further update. Uh, I mean, the reality is though, uh, we learned last week that uh, across Scotland, uh, over 100,000 patients have had to find new GP services because their local practice has closed due to uh, excessive uh, shortages of GPs right across. Every one of us will have uh, constituents who are struggling to get an appointment, who are queuing on a Monday morning or can't get through on the telephone to get an appointment. This isn't just an out-of-hours problem, this is a during-hours problem as well. Uh, so what I would like to hear is what action is the government taking to address these systemic uh, problems of GP shortages right across uh, Scotland and can she assure us and ensure the wider public that this isn't just a blip what happened at the weekend in Glasgow wasn't just the one-off uh, and that this is not a systemic problem that is facing us right across the country on a continuous basis because that uh, minister simply isn't good enough minister okay I can assure uh, Jamie Green that I share his concerns and that um, I want to ensure that the, the people of Glasgow and the people of Scotland indeed get the NHS service that they need. You'll be aware that we've had the recent rollout of the new GP contract, which helps to reduce the workload of on GPs so that they are able to spend more time dealing with the more complex cases on their caseload, the more complex patients. And we're looking at the expansion of the primary care team, um, encompassing uh, advanced nurse practitioners and AHPs, 
in order to free up GP time so that they do have a, a, a lower uh, workload, but also that they're able to use their skills more effectively. Um, we've also been um, investing in primary care pharmacy uh, and the minor injuries or the minor ailments uh, services. So I can assure him that we certainly are um, looking at the workload of our GPs and looking to expand uh, the number of GPs that we've had. We've increased medical places in Scottish universities. They'll be increased by 22%. Uh, and that's an extra 190 places between 2015 and 2021. Jackie Bailey to be followed by Stuart McMillan. Jackie Bailey. I am delighted that the Vale of Leven out of hours service was open and join in praising the staff. The irony, of course, is that it is normally the Vale that is closed. Over 80 shutdowns for out of hours last year alone, over 40 so far this year. So can I ask the Minister, would she look at using salaried GPs or indeed even allowing local GPs covering the Vale catchment area to arrange out of hours care at the Vale of Leven Hospital? Minister. I would expect that uh, that will be something that will be discussed at the uh, at Lewis Ritchie's review and looking at what Greater Glasgow and Clyde are doing to ensure that they have adequate GPs to cover out of hours. Uh, my understanding is that there are some salaried GPs within the out of hours GP service as a whole. Um, however, most of the GPs who work in out of hours are not salaried GPs. Stuart McMillan to be followed by Anas Sawar. Stuart McMillan. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Um, as the Minister is aware that staff can be deployed throughout the, the, the system to ensure that uh, adequate cover is maintained uh, across the, the health board area. Uh, and with that being the case, is, there a, is the Minister aware if there is a preference uh, as to which out of our centres will actually be open on any given weekend? Minister. Um, I'm not able, to, I don't have that information to hand for Mr McMillan, but um, I can make a commitment that um, I will request a, that he gets that information as soon as I have it. And the last hour. Thank you, officer. Obviously, Saturday night is a peak time for A&E services across the west of Scotland, indeed across uh, the whole of Scotland. Uh, does the minister recognise that there are two impacts, one on the patients who are maybe having to wait much longer, having to access NHS 24, or showing up in A&E, whereas they wouldn't normally show up in A&E, therefore increasing their own waiting time? And secondly, an impact on the NHS staff who are already overworked as it is in terms of the more pressures they will face in terms of less and less staff and more and more requirements on them. And if she recognises those two pressures, what urgent steps, I understand the point about the review, but what urgent steps will she take to reassure patients across Glasgow and the West of Scotland that they can have a wraparound out of our service? Minister. Well, as, as I said in my previous answer um, to uh, Mr Green, I'm not happy with the level of services that were provided at the weekend. And we do expect that Great Glasgow and Clyde and the Health and Social Care Partnership will look at their service to ensure that they, we don't end up in a situation uh, as we did at the weekend. Um, you, what, the points that Mr Sarwar raises are, are quite valid points. Um, and again, I would like to pay tribute to the staff who were on duty on, on a Saturday, Sunday night. Um, and who did provide a service to the people of Glasgow. And question number two, Daniel Johnson. To ask the Scottish Government what its response is to reports that prisoners are being transported in family vehicles. Cabinet Secretary Ashton, oh sorry, Minister Ashton. <laughs> Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Prisoner Escort and Court Custody Services contract is with Geo Amy. The services provided under the contract include movement of those arrested from police custody to court, and those held in prison to court and to any other location, including hospitals and other prisons. Geo Amy has a range of different vehicles within its fleet and the contractor carries out robust risk assessment and makes a decision about the most suitable vehicle in which to escort the individual. The type of vehicle is only one factor in ensuring the security of an escort. For example, the type of vehicle to which Daniel Johnson refers are used to transport sentenced children and young people, as well as pregnant women in custody. Non-cellular vehicles are used where it is appropriate to do so. And the safety and well-being of the staff, of those being transported, as well as the general public, is of paramount importance to both the Scottish Prison Service and the Scottish Government. Daniel Johnson. I thank the Minister for the answer, but the reality is, according to those reports, that we have convicted murderers uh, being uh, transported in such family vehicles who then went on to strike prison staff while that vehicle was doing 60 miles an hour on the A90. 
Surely the question is, is a vehicle like that ever suitable for transporting such a violent individual as reported in the press at the weekend? Cabinet uh, Minister. Um, I did check with the SPS uh, this morning and as uh, the member will no, no doubt be aware, a new contract has uh, been awarded and started in January this year. And to date, there have been no incidents uh, reported to the SPS under the new contract. Um, a dynamic risk assessment is carried out before deciding the most appropriate vehicle in which to escort an individual. And if someone is considered to be high risk, it's unlikely that a non-cellular vehicle would be used. At the appropriate stage of their sentence, individuals who have committed serious offences, such as murder, and that was mentioned by Daniel Johnson just now, um, are escorted in non-cellular vehicles. Whilst um, the offence is of a serious and high-profile nature, the individuals being escorted will have been subject to that risk assessment to determine that they are suitable for this type of escort. And these type of individuals are most likely to be accessing the community on licence and therefore are not considered to be high risk at that point in time. Daniel Johnson. Again, I thank the Minister for that response, but does such a possibility not at least uh, hint at the possibility that the risk assessments are inadequate? Does the Minister not feel that at the very least a partition should be installed in such vehicles to protect hard-working prison staff from the risks that, that such prisoners may pose? And finally, will the Minister agree to meet with representatives from the GMB who represent those staff to discuss the safety concerns that they continue to have? Minister. Thank you. Um, with regard to the point about um, safety within cars, in April 2019, Amy tested new bulkheads for the cars, and these are now being installed um, throughout the fleet as a way of improving driver safety. And um, I've been advised that that rollout will be complete at the end of this month. And this additional measure has the support of the community trade union, who are the recognised trade union representing staff who work in this area. But um, the member has obviously requested um, for a meeting with um, a trade union, and I am sure the cabinet secretary would be happy to take that meeting. I've got up to five members that wish to ask a supplementary, so if members could keep their questions brief. Rona Mackay to be followed by Liam Kerr. Thank you, presiding officer. Can the minister confirm whether non-cellular vehicles have been routinely used to transfer high-risk offenders, including those convicted of serious crimes such as murder? Minister. Um, I thank the member for that question. There are about 180,000 movements um, that are undertaken and the vast majority of those are undertaken in cellular vehicles. Um, there are occasions when um, non-cellular vehicles are used and obviously they are sometimes appropriate. For instance, if you have ch um, children and young people that are being transported um, or also pregnant women who are going to hospital appointments and so on, I'm sure the member would recognise that in those type of instances uh, a non-cellular vehicle is the most appropriate form of transport. Liam Kerr to be followed by John Finney. Thank you, President Officer. Look, in terms of appropriate equipment and staff safety, prison officers have to deal with an increasingly high-risk environment. Now, prison officers south of the border have been equipped with body-worn cameras, but the SNP has refused to give the same to our officers. Why does the SNP think that their safety is less important? Minister. Um, we absolutely do not think that their safety is less important. And obviously, the Scottish Prison Service um, doesn't um, have a record of concerns raised by staff. But if any instances are raised um, with the contractor, they would then be passed on to the SPS, who would investigate every single incident to see if there are any um, lessons that need to be learned in that case. And there is a robust process, I would assure the member, there is a robust process in place to monitor and investigate all incidents um, as reported by the contractor. But as I uh, reiterate in uh, my previous answer to Daniel Johnson, that so far under this contract, which um, began in January, there haven't been any um, incidents reported um, so far. John Finney to be followed by Liam MacArthur. Thank you, President Officer. Minister, isn't the issue here that with only one bidder for a contract worth £238 million, and you talk about robust risk assessments, but then you qualify it by saying where appropriate and unlikely, isn't it time that the Scottish Government reviewed this provision and took it back in-house? Minister. I thank the member for that um, question. I do take on board the concerns that the member has raised. Um, the escorting contract has, of course, freed up frontline staff in both the Scottish Prison Service 
and also in Police Scotland and allowed them to undertake their core duties. And prior to the inception of the contract, these duties required staff to be diverted from key tasks to escort prisoners to and from prisons, from police stations to hospital appointments and so on. The Scottish Government and its agencies set the standards of the service and they assess bidders on a number of criteria including their organisational values and this allows us to ensure that the terms of how they operate are well aligned with what Scottish ministers would want to see from the service in Scotland. And then these contracts are rigorously monitored to ensure that they provide the taxpayer with the best service delivery that is possible. Liam MacArthur to be followed by Fulton McGregor. Thank you. President Officer GOME were awarded this £238 million contract, as John Finney said, after alternative providers dropped out and despite a track record, including multiple violent uh, escapes and critical equipment failures. Does the Minister believe that companies must be held accountable in these circumstances? And does she agree that that could be achieved by extending the remit of FOI legislation to include private companies operating these public contracts? Minister. I think that the member has raised an important, important point there, and I do believe that these contractors should be held account for their level of service. Um, I don't have any um, further information on the point the member has raised, so I will undertake to write to the member with a fuller answer to his question. Fulton McGregor. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Um, following on from Rona Mackay's, uh, the answer to Rona Mackay's question earlier, can the Minister clarify um, what vehicles children and young people travel in? Minister. Um, children and young people are transported in non-cellular escort vehicles which have themselves a range of securing measures. For example, each vehicle must be fitted with a locking system such that the child or young person cannot operate the windows and doors. And these vehicles must not in any way identify uh, the purpose for which the vehicle is being used. And they must be of a size capable of accommodating a minimum of three adults in the rear seat to ensure for sufficient comfort on a long journey. Thank you very much. And that concludes topical questions. We're going to move on now to the next item of business, which is a debate on motion 17503 in the name of Liam Kerr on whole life custody sentences. And I would invite all members who wish to participate in this debate to press their request to speak buttons as soon as possible.